Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. It is good to see you guys, and uh, somebody already mentioned what a difference a week makes. Last week it was raining, and obviously continued to rain. We want to pray and think about all of the people that are affected by the flood. But the sun is out today, and it is absolutely beautiful. We have a great worship service today. Uh, we don't always get to experience this every single week, but we have a baby dedication today, and that'll happen after the second song. And uh, in addition to that, there is a guy who kind of serves as a mentor for me, and he texts me every single Sunday morning and shares that he's praying for me and also for all the people who come to the bridge, which would also include you. And this is what he prayed for us this morning. Praying that those gathered at the bridge this morning allow the Holy Spirit to have free reign in their lives. So I just want to invite you, I'm going to read a few verses from Psalm 103 as kind of a call to worship today. But just that the Holy Spirit is always at work and God is always calling us and drawing us near. And that this is an invitation to that. This is what David writes about the Lord. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he, har nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. I don't know when the last time was you looked up at the sky, but it's pretty far up. And that is how great his love is for us. So why don't you go ahead and stand, greet someone near you, and then we'll prepare to sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Good morning. Uh, Stephen already touched on this, and it is interesting. When we stand up here and we get to look at you as a whole, there is a definite difference between your disposition last week and your disposition this week. It's amazing what a little sunlight and 68 degrees will do. Amen? Amen. So when we go into blessed be your name, let's think about that. We got to bless him even in the bad times. We have days like this. It's one thing I love about not having a drop off or a parking lot. You guys get to park and walk a little bit. It's fun to work on walk on days like this, isn't it? Amen. Let's lift it up to you this morning. Blessed be your name in the land. Here we go. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing, lift it up. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will stay. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. On the road marked with suffering. And in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Lift it up. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. Show your appreciation. Show your love for him this morning. This is a word from Psalm 27 from David. We know about David. We know how far David fell. We know the, the stumbles David made, but he still had a heart for the Lord. And he says to us in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And that is the exact truth that whom shall I fear? God of angel armies, the song we're going to sing is based on. Amen? So uh, let's sing that out and just worry. Think about all the things that you worry about, all the things that you go through. You still have him there. There's nobody to fear because we've got the God of angel armies on our side. Amen? You hear me when I call. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the god of angel armies is always by my side my strength is in your name my strength is in your name for you alone can save
Lift it up to him this morning. And I believe you can go ahead and have a seat for a second. And over to Stephen. So one of probably the, my favorite things that we have the opportunity to do at the bridge is to witness parents and families dedicate their children to the Lord. And uh, one thing that's really exciting, and I'm going to have John and Kayla and their daughter Brenna come at this time. And if you have not had an opportunity to meet them, you need to. They're awesome people. I remember them as kids at summer sport. I think John was in a swim lesson class I taught, and Kayla swam on the swim team I coached for a while. And then I hadn't seen them for a really long time. And then they land at the bridge and worship here with us. And uh, we have the opportunity to hear a little bit of their story that John's going to share. And then we're going to have an opportunity to dedicate them to the Lord. So if you want to come and... morning. Um, so when Kayla and I, is this on? Talk a little louder. When uh, Kayla and I sat down to write our dedication letter, I pulled out a piece of scratch paper from our nightstand. Uh, to our surprise, ironically, it was a to-do list that Kayla had written before Brenna was born. <laughs> a few of the items on the list were, and I'll give you guys a consolidated version, to finalize names, install a car seat, organize the baby room, pack the hospital bags, uh, purchase a mattress, and relax. <laughs> Unfortunately, not a single item on this list was accomplished. Unexpectedly, Brenna was born six weeks early due to a complication that can often be fatal to the mother and especially the child. Brenna's birth is a true testament in the power of prayer. Kayla and I prayed routinely that God would help keep our baby growing strong, healthy, and happy. Her arrival into this world was nothing short of a miracle to us and, we were, and was a true intervention of God at work answering our prayers. Brenna was strong, healthy, and we were extremely blessed to go home as a family just three days later. As parents, Kayla and I want to do everything we can to love, care, and provide for Brenna, but we understand there will be adverse situations in her life that will be out of our control. In those instances, we want her to know God's love and have a firm foundation of God in her life that she can always turn to to find strength and comfort in. So today, Kayla and I want to make a commitment to raise Brenna in the Christian faith and instill in her the desire to be close to Jesus and to share his love with others around her. Amen. <laughs> As you got to hear that from John um, and what John and Kayla are seeking to do, and they have friends and family with them today. And just if you guys, uh, friends and family of John and Kayla and Brenda that are here, if you just want to kind of raise your hand as well, this is their support group. We're happy you're here with us at the bridge. And we are about to witness, and John and Kayla have already dedicated in their hearts and made this decision to dedicate their daughter to the Lord. We get to formalize it with a prayer. But as we were thinking, um, and I was thinking this week about what a dedication to the Lord means, there is this great promise and great reminder, and we just sang it in that song. The God of angel armies is always by my side. As we seek to dedicate our lives and our children to the Lord, the Lord, because of Jesus, is dedicated to us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So John and Kayla, I want you guys to know you're going to go through successes as parents. You probably know that. And you're going to go through epic failures as parents. You probably know that also. But the God of angel armies is always by your side. And he's smiling today. And you are glorifying him. And he's got you and he's got your daughter, and he's going to take good care of you guys. We have the privilege and the opportunity to share in that. John and Kayla are, are part of our church family, and as part of this church family, we want to invite you, if you make a commitment and promise to walk alongside John and Kayla to where Brenna knows the love of Jesus 
to pray for her, to pray with them, and to teach them of the love of God, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can right now. So you have this support system as well with you too. And then as you have your hand up, if you just want to kind of point it out toward Brenna, we're going to go ahead and pray for her and for John and Kayla now. So Father, we are so grateful for the love that you have given to Brenna. And we pray that as John and Kayla seek to dedicate her to you today, we know you will hold her. You will never let go of her. And we pray that you may bless her and guide her and that all the days of her life, she knows that Jesus loves her and can be her firm foundation and her rock. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. And also... On behalf of the church, we want to give you this Jesus Storybook Bible that you guys can read to Brenda now, and later she'll be able to read on her own. So, thank you. you. It's always a blessing to see and celebrate a new dedication to God. So, um, we also want to take a moment in our service now to celebrate some of our other blessings, and we want to invite all of our children, kindergarten through fifth grade, to go ahead and make their way to Children's Church this morning. As they're heading towards those doors, we want to make sure that we pray over our children and pray over that ministry as well. So please bow your heads and pray with me. Father God, it is always, always a joy to celebrate your little ones because we know that you said many, many years ago that you were calling them to you and you said, let the children come to me and we just want to continue to celebrate what you're doing in the lives of the children of the bridge. We ask that you um, be with them in their children's church this morning. God, that you be with the teachers and give them the words they need to, to help each young mind grow and fall more in love with you. Amen. As I was thinking about the next song we're going to sing this week, I actually began thinking of it in light of the blessings that just walked out the door. And as as children like little Brenna continue to grow, they're going to get to a stage where they're going to start to find their own self-thought independence. They're going to reach that I can do it myself stage. And if we're all honest, if I'm honest, there are times in my spiritual walk where I'm the same way. And I kind of say, you God, you can step back. I got this. I can do it myself. But we know from watching the little ones and probably from our own um, failures and relying on our own strength that we can't do it on our own. Because the truth is if we could do it by ourselves, we wouldn't need a savior. We wouldn't need the one who said, I'm going to pay the ultimate price for you so you can find in me your all in all. Because that's why I died on the cross. And that's what it's all about. And that's what we're going to sing about in our next song. So I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand with us once more as we sing our praises to Christ who paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now Still repeat Jesus 
Stephen this morning and I pray that our, our eyes and our hearts are open to see what you want it to see, not what we want it. Um, I want to thank you for, uh, for life and green and just uh, thanks for the sunny day of God and uh, just thank you very much and we love you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it has already been a powerful (laughs) worship service. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 21. We have, uh, I have an interesting confession as we go to John 21. We spent the month of April uh, looking at the life of Jesus uh, and some key things that happened leading up to Easter and then some of the appearances of Jesus after Jesus rose from the dead. Before that, we were in the book of Joshua, and my thought was we would return to the book of Joshua in May. So I began studying Joshua chapter 9. And Joshua chapter 9, Joshua makes this mistake. Some, this group comes to him and it says that he believed the group because he did not inquire or ask the Lord. And I'm reading and praying and I'm sensing that I don't know that I'm supposed to preach this. I think I just thought in my head, we'll do Resurrection of Jesus stuff in April, and then we'll just go back to Joshua. And I begin to ask, God, I, I don't think I asked you where we're supposed to be next. I think I'm making the same mistake that Joshua made whenever he didn't ask you about this group called the Gibeonites. And there's a good chance that you've done that once or twice in your life also that you have this plan set up. I love how John mentioned that they had this to-do list before Brenna was born and that they didn't successfully accomplish any of those things because sometimes we have to acknowledge the fact that though we want to believe we have a lot of control, we really have very little control over the circumstances and situations of our life. But God does 
And God has given us an invitation to ask Him and inquire of Him on what we're called to do with our lives. So as we prepare to read the first part of John chapter 21, I want to invite you to inquire of the Lord, to ask God as we read this word, His word to us today. God, what would you have me to see? What do you want me to hear? And what do you want me to do as a result of what I'm going to hear now? This is what God's Word says to us. John 21, beginning with verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you so much for your word and your spirit. Help us, God. Help us to hear you and help us to respond to you. Give us grace and remind us of the deep, deep love of your Son, our Savior and Lord. May Jesus be glorified today. It's in his name we pray. Amen. It's important to think a little bit about these seven guys that in my mind are around a table and I think that everyone's pretty quiet and I think that the mood is a little bit tense. It is true, Jesus has risen from the dead and he has shown himself to the disciples, but the disciples have no idea what the future looks like. After all, it's not every day that someone dies and comes back from the dead. And they're wondering, what's, what's next? What's going to happen next? And John gives us a list in verse 2 of these guys. Simon Peter. What do we know about Peter? Well, a lot of things. I asked a group last night, what do you know about Peter? And the immediate response was, he's impulsive. He was. Whatever he thought, he usually did. But he also was all heart. And what did Peter tell Jesus when Jesus predicted that all the disciples would leave him in his hour of need? Peter said, no, 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 Jesus. Not me. 
If all those guys over there, I mean, they may leave you. I can't, I can't speak for them. But I will never leave you. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny that you even know me three times. I don't know if, I do know. I, I can speak to the fact that we have all done something that we have not been proud of. And the guilt can be treacherous and painful and debilitating and leave us just stuck. And could it be that when Simon Peter is sitting around the table with these guys, he's replaying in his mind, I said I would never leave. And I denied that I even knew him three times. I'm not cut out anymore to be his follower. I'm not worthy to be one of his disciples. I should just throw in the towel. So in Peter's mind, could it be that maybe he's rewinding and he's rewinding past scenes of watching Jesus touch the eyes of the blind man and restore sight and touch the legs of a lame person and they walk and heal the lepers and raise the dead. And he's rewinding past all that to the first time he met Jesus. And what was Peter doing then? He was, he was fishing. And that Peter goes back and goes, okay, I know what Jesus told me. I know Jesus said from now on you will not fish for fish. From now on you will be a fisher of men. But I just disqualified myself from that role. So I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my nets. I'll go back to my old job before Jesus called me. You could maybe be wondering. There are moments that maybe you've experienced a deep, close intimacy with Jesus. And then something's happened. Something's gone wrong. Something hasn't worked out. And you think, well, I'm just done. I'm just finished. I'm not worthy. I'm not good at it. I'll just go back. There's an older man that lived out in the country and had several hundred acres of, of land. I pastored at the church previous to this one. And I would go out and visit him sometimes. And you know what he would say? Because he never would go to church anymore, but his wife did. He would say, you know what? That day that I was baptized, I was so close to God, I could hear him. And then something happened, and I don't hear him anymore. And my favorite verse in the Bible is the verse in Job that talks about how many are the days of a man and trouble thereof. Because that's been my life. Many days and lots of trouble. But then he'd go back to the day that he was baptized. But that day, that day I was close to God. And sadly, he was never convinced that the God who spoke to him the day he was baptized would speak to him again. This chapter tells us something different. This chapter tells us that Jesus will make and serve breakfast for failures, for losers. That Jesus is not done with you or me. And if you think that Jesus is done with you, you need to just destroy the lie, okay? Just eliminate that from your mind and your head. He's not done with you. How do I know that? Because the first person that Jesus, John mentions in this list is Simon Peter. You want to label Simon Peter? The denier. Have you denied Jesus before? Who's next? Thomas, called the twin. We all know his label, right? Doubting Thomas. We heard about it last week in church. But he's here, around the table. Because he saw Jesus. Because he... He missed a meeting one time 
And Jesus came. He's like, I'm not going to miss the meeting anymore. Wherever those disciples go, I'm going to be there. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to be there now. But who's around the table so far? Peter the denier, Thomas the doubter. Who's next? Nathaniel. You know that John is the only gospel that tells us anything about the biography of Nathaniel? And it doesn't look very good. At the end of chapter 1, Nathaniel had a really good friend named Philip, and Philip met Jesus and was pumped. When people meet Jesus, they get excited and they want to tell other people. If you think you met Jesus, but you don't ever want to tell anybody else about him, you haven't really met Jesus yet. Philip runs to his friend Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, great news, we met the Messiah. Nathaniel looks and goes, oh yeah, where does he live? Philip said, he, he's from Nazareth. Nathaniel goes, no, Philip, you didn't meet the Messiah because nothing good could come out of Nazareth. That's a podunk town in the middle of nowhere. God would not send the Messiah from a town like Nazareth. It isn't going to happen. So we have Peter the denier, Thomas the doubter, and Nathaniel the skeptic. You fit any of those categories? Maybe all of the above? Denier, doubter, skeptic? But then Jesus comes to Nathaniel and says, Hey, Nathaniel, guess what? I saw you when you were praying under that tree. Nathaniel goes, You are the Messiah. And Jesus says, Nathaniel, if you thought that was great, follow me. You haven't seen anything yet. Next on the list, the sons of Zebedee. It's the only time John refers to the sons of Zebedee. Who were they? Himself and James. But you know what the sons of Zebedee do one time? They get really mad at somebody, and they ask Jesus for permission. Jesus, can we call down lightning and thunderbolts and annihilate these people from the face of the earth? They're called the sons of thunder. Because somebody has said something to them that made them mad and they just want to get them off the face of the earth. I've got some anger issues. So who's around this table? A denier, a doubter, a skeptic, and two brothers that have anger issues. And then two other disciples that, and, and there were two others. Some theologians think it was Philip and Andrew, but we don't know for sure. We do know there's seven guys around here. But you know what else it says? The end of verse 2, it says, they were together. You know what meeting Jesus does? It will unite you to other people like nothing else. That there will be a common bond because of the Holy Spirit that will trump race and socioeconomic background and thought process Because Jesus is the center. And these guys are a mess. And every single one of these guys at certain times are what Rick Warren refers to as EGR people, which stands for extra grace required. It's not fun hanging out with a denier or a doubter or a skeptic or people that could fly off the handle at any given moment. But they're together. And then Thomas, or sorry, Simon Peter finally opens his mouth and says, I'm going fishing. I'm reading into this a little bit, but I think that Simon Peter is thinking, I can still do something. I was a good fisherman before I met Jesus. I was a good fisherman. I'll go fish. And the other guys don't leave him by himself. I said, we're going with you. You know, when someone's going through guilt and condemnation and depression and struggle, they need people to go fishing with them. They need people to follow them. They need people in their lives. So they go and they get in this boat and it says, they fish all night and they catch nothing. This is God in his grace 
giving us the gift of failure. You say, what? Wait a second. No, God only gives the gift of success. He does. But when we attempt to do something apart from Jesus, he gives us the gift of falling flat on our faces. So they're fishing all night, and it says that they just, and they kept on fishing all night and all night. And I imagine Peter on the boat saying, I don't know what the story is, but drop the net over here now, and now over here, and now over here. And he's working until he's just dead tired. It's like, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know I can do this. I love how Gwen introduced the song, Jesus Paid It All. Because, and I don't know if she knew that, but that's really part of today's message. Is that we can tend to think, I got it. I don't need your help. I can do it without you. Well, the disciples tried that. And they don't catch a single fish. It's a long night. Have you gone through long nights in your life? even seasons of long nights before? You know what the gospel says? Morning's about to break. And joy comes in the morning. And mercies are new in the morning. And it says, just as day was breaking in verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore. I know who the difference maker is for the Christian. It is always Jesus And Jesus is standing on the shore of whatever it is you're going through. He is not far. He is closer than you could ever imagine. You know what's funny? They don't recognize him. What happens when I'm in a dark place, when it's been a long night, when I'm depressed? I don't always recognize Jesus. He's there, but I don't always see him. And then Jesus speaks. Children, do you have any fish? One way to translate this from the Greek is Jesus saying, Children, you don't have any fish, do you? (laughs) There is a little bit of Jesus rubbing it into them, saying, I see you. I've seen you try to do this on your own. If you're a parent, you get this. You'll watch your kids go their own way sometimes and give it a try and go, you you didn't get it done, did you? It didn't work very well on your own, did you? You know, in the midst of this depression and this disobedience and Peter and Peter taking other people with him to kind of try to do it without Jesus, that Jesus still calls them children. That though the fellowship is strained, the relationship is solid. And the relationship is solid not because of their great faith and their wonderful obedience, but because of Jesus' faithfulness and his perfect obedience and what he did on the cross for all who trust in Jesus. calls them children. But they're not focused on that children word. They're focused on, you don't have any fish, do you? And I think the seven of them on the boat are looking at each other like, who is this wise guy anyway? This stranger on the shore rubbing it in. They're like, their response, one word, no. You know what no with a period means? No, I don't want to talk about it. Don't bring it up anymore. But Jesus brings it up. And Jesus will bring it up for you and me also. Because you know what Jesus wants us to admit and acknowledge? We can't save ourselves. We can't catch fish by ourselves. We don't work and operate well by ourselves. We need him. So Jesus asks, you and me. I'll personalize it. Stephen, life isn't working very well for you, is it? That's his question to me. When I go my own way, apart from the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And he'll get you to a point of failure. 
And there's grace in that failure where eventually you have to look at Jesus and say, no, it's not going very well. And Jesus will never leave you and me in that state. It's interesting that when they say no, Jesus does not walk away. Jesus invites them to listen to him. They weren't listening to him before. And now here's another invitation to listen. Cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When Jesus says this, those seven men have a decision to make on the boat. You know what they could think? Could think, who is this guy? Doesn't he know we're professional fishermen? And we fished all night and worked really hard and fish are just not coming to the net right now. And this guy is telling us, just drop your net. They're only 100 yards out. This is kind of shallow water. This is, it makes no sense at all. A lot of things that God calls us to do make no sense at all when we use human logic. And we've got to get past that to say, ultimately what they have to decide is, am I teachable? Am I humble? Am I willing to let someone else call the shots in my life in areas that I think I am an expert in? Will I entrust them to Jesus? Can Jesus be Lord? Or do I think I know where to drop the net? And you know what? When you still think that you know where to drop the net and you won't listen to Jesus, you will not experience the catching of fish. And you will not experience breakfast with your Savior. I don't know with what attitude they did it. They could have shrugged their shoulders and said, well, what the heck, we've tried just about everything else. We'll drop the net on the right side of the boat. But they do listen to him. Sometimes I can obey with my heart not really in it. It's like, I know that I'm supposed to do this thing, but I don't really want to, but I will. Some people hear that And they go, well, you shouldn't even do it because if your heart's not in it, then why bother? You know what I've discovered? When I do that thing that I know I should do, even when my heart's not in it, God performs a miracle in my heart. And by the time I'm done, I am so grateful that I did it and my heart is feeling it also. This is this song, you know, you've lost that loving feeling. I mean, I know it's popular, okay, but the sentiment and the message of that is anti-gospel and anti-walking with Jesus. Sometimes God calls us to do what we're supposed to do and trust him whether we feel it or not and trust him to create the feelings in us. Because trust me, I agree. I love praising Jesus when I have the warm, good, goosebump feelings more Then when I'm like, oh, seriously, this song again? I do think that sometimes. But when I think, oh, seriously, this song again, but I still say, God, help me praise through it. By the end of the song, the feeling of God's presence is there. So they drop their net, regardless of the motivation and them dropping their net, they drop their net. And I love it. It says, Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. You know what Jesus' posture toward his people is? To bless you abundantly. To pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And it is our disobedience and our unbelief that basically dams up the blessings of God and does not let them flow into our lives. Do you trust him? Let me meddle a little bit. Do you trust him with your finances? Do you trust that when God says, I'll tell you what, you can live on 90% of your income better if you give me 10%. Do you trust him in that? 
Do you trust Him with your time? Do you make to-do lists without inquiring of the Lord and then wonder why you can't get it done? I'll tell you why you can't get it done. Because you didn't inquire of the Lord first. You ask God, God, you organize my time. You do this thing. You tell me what my priority should be on my to-do list. And I'll trust you in it. In relationships, is Jesus Lord of them? Or are you? Some of you are like, well, how do I even discern that? Do you struggle to forgive people? Do you sometimes think that your unwillingness to give grace to someone else is actually appropriate judgment of God? Or are you saying, wait, God, I want my posture and my feeling in this relationship to be filled by you. And you are the judge. And I'll trust you to do that. You protect me and help me know how to love someone well. And by loving someone well, I'm not saying give them exactly what they want all the time. There's a fine line between enablement and true, genuine love. But there are so many areas of my life, and I'm preaching to myself and stepping on my own toes here, where I'm like, man, God, I want to trust you in this. I want to drop my net where you tell me to, but sometimes I'm slow. But then I look at the fish that they caught, and I go, God, if I only knew that this is what you want from me instead, if I entrust this thing to you, it's going to be better than if I try to hold on to it myself. They can't haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And now verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, and look at who he says it to. He says it to Peter. This disciple whom Jesus loved, who is this? It's John. It's the author of this gospel. But John knows who's hurting the most out of his brothers. And he looks at Peter and says, Peter, It is the Lord. When I'm depressed and I'm down and I've gone through a dark night, I need another brother or sister in Christ to tell me, Stephen, it is the Lord. The Lord is in this circumstance. The Lord is in this situation. He is fighting on your behalf and he will get you through it. And so many of you that are sitting out here right now have been there and done that for me. Thank you. What would it look like if we as a church family just continually did that for one another. I was telling John and Caleb before the service that I met with them last week and heard their story. And I said, I, I, I've not been able to contain that story in my heart. So look at this and go, okay, Brenna comes six weeks early. There's, there's something about to go wrong and go bad. And Then there's this miracle of this little girl that now today is being glorified as their parents dedicate her to the Lord. I go, I can't contain that. You know what someone else could have said? Why did this happen? Why didn't I get my to-do list done? I can look and go, no, it's the Lord. The Lord is working through every situation. We just have to look and see he's on the shore. But how did John know this? John knew this because in Luke chapter 5, there's a similar account. They fish all night, but Jesus isn't in the boat. And then they pull up and Jesus says, hey, Peter, can I use your boat to preach on? And Peter goes, sure. And then after Peter's done preaching, or Jesus is done teaching and preaching, Jesus says, hey, Peter, let's go fishing. And Peter goes, I fished all night, haven't caught anything. And Jesus gives him a look. And Peter goes, okay, because you say so, we'll go. You know what happens? Jesus tells them where to drop the net. And they've such a big catch of fish that the nets begin to break. But you know what Jesus, Peter's response to Jesus is in that account? He drops to his knees and says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. 
You know what Jesus' response, Peter's response is in John 21? It says he throws himself in the water and swims as fast as he can to get to Jesus. What's happened? John records in John 19 that Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, paid in full. We're saying Jesus paid it all. And now Peter is swimming to Jesus, knowing that Jesus is not going to stiff arm him. Jesus is going to embrace him. In my mind, as Peter's swimming, I want to imagine Jesus walking into the lake, into the water, to meet him there as he's swimming. This is what Jesus does. When we take steps toward him, he takes steps toward us. And then the disciples come with the boat and the net. And I think all six of those guys on the boat, when, Jesus, when Peter dies in, they're like, yep, he's going to get over it. His dark night is over. Just let him swim. We'll take care of the fish. But then when they get there, what happens? Jesus has already cooked breakfast. There's bread, there's fish already there. Because Jesus delights in eating meals with you and me. And he prepares it. And then, I love this, Jesus says to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. And Peter, which people have looked at this passage and said, we can know that Peter is a big, strong man from this passage. Because Peter runs by himself and single-handedly takes 153 fish that are in a net, nets and all, and drags it all by himself up to Jesus. This is Peter, Jesus, this is Peter saying, Jesus, I'll do anything for you again. And I've got the brute strength and I've got the impulsiveness. I'm ready. Whatever you need, Jesus, I'll do it for you. What if we behave that way? Whatever you need, Jesus, I'll do it for you. You know what else I love about this? Jesus invites the fishermen to bring what they have to contribute to the meal. You and I are invited to bring what we have to contribute to kingdom growth. And some of you can look and go, I, I don't know what I have. I don't know what my talents are. I don't know what my time is. It, Jesus gives it to you did the fishermen catch those fish? Kind of, but not exactly. Jesus told them exactly where to drop the net, and they just listened. And as you listen, he will tell you where to drop your net when it comes to your time and your talents and your treasure. He'll tell you where to drop the net, and then he invites you. Now contribute to this meal. Come and bring some of what you have to it. And sometimes it's just telling your story. Only in heaven are we going to know how many people were touched as God was glorified as John and Kayla dedicate their little girl to the Lord today. Only in heaven will we know that. Sometimes it's just telling your story. And finally, come and have breakfast. It's simple, isn't it? It's simple. Most of the things in life that really make a difference are the simple things. A smile, an encouraging word, an invitation to a meal. Just come and have breakfast. So we have Jesus the denier, Thomas the doubter, Nathaniel the skeptic, and two brothers with anger issues coming to eat breakfast with Jesus. If Jesus invited them to have breakfast with him, then he's also inviting you and me to have breakfast with him. The question is, when he instructs you where to drop your net, will you listen? Will you obey? And then when he blesses you, and he will, will, he, will you give some of how he blessed you back to him? Let's pray. Father, we ask 
that you would come and serve us breakfast. And that we would not think that we don't need it, that we would know and recognize and identify the fact that we do. Thank you that you don't give up on us when we deny and doubt, when we're skeptical, when we're angry. You do not stop. You're standing on the shore, inviting us to come. God, may we hear and respond to your call today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next week, we're going to hear the rest of John 21. But when we hear the rest of it, we're going to discover that Jesus does take Peter aside. You know what question he asks Peter, and he asks it three times. Simon, son of John, another name for Peter. Do you love me? Part of our response, part of the invitation to be blessed by having Jesus serve us breakfast today is to acknowledge, Jesus, I love you. I can't make it without you. I need you. So our song of response is, Lord, I need you. Let's stand and sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart.
next song is 10,000 Reasons or Bless the Lord. Um, and there's a lot of s scriptures that could go with that, but I decided that I would share a personal experience that I have been blessed with this week. And for three months, my sister was in Ecuador and she came back on Friday night. And for me, the blessing is not only seeing her, but seeing what God has done through her throughout this trip and how it just overflows in a way that I didn't see in her before. And it's been a very good blessing. So as we sing, um, just think about blessings that you have received from Jesus, whether it's through others or through him yourself. Amen. Let's lift it up to you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. O oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy
worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Yes, I worship Your. Jesus stands on the shore. He calls us children. You don't have any fish, do you? But if you turn to the other side, if you drop your net on the right side of the fish, of the, of the boat, you will catch some. This is supposed to be next week, but I think it's supposed to be a lead-in. I'm supposed to say this today. After Peter professes his love for Jesus three times, Jesus tells Peter, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted, but when you are old, someone else will dress you and take you to where you do not want to go. And then John writes in parentheses that Jesus was actually predicting the way in which Peter would die and be killed for glorifying Jesus. Church tradition tells us that at some point there were people that grabbed Peter, dressed him, took him where he didn't want to go, and put him on a cross. And Peter said, don't crucify me like my Savior. If you must crucify me, you crucify me upside down. And just as we say in this song, when my Strength is ending. The end draws near. When Peter breathed his last breath, I believe that as he was ushered into heaven, that he threw himself out of the boat again and swam to Jesus who had breakfast already prepared for him again. That is our hope as believers that the one who called us and never lets us go will get us all the way home. So no matter how many dark nights you have, no matter how many depressed moments you experience, Jesus is on the shore. And one way we remind each other of that is by being surrounded with brothers and sisters in Christ who can say, it is the Lord. If you do not have a church home, a church family, we would consider it an honor and a privilege for you to come and be part of ours. Let's receive this benediction. And now, God, to you, the one who sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, thank you that he shows up on the shores of our lives and tells us where to drop our nets and gives us blessing and serves us breakfast. May we go and that power today, and make much of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. May you go with God's grace and peace.